Um, I'm really happy to introduce Rich DeMillo, who is the Distinguished Professor of Computing and Professor of Management, um, the former John P. Imlay Dean of Computing, and the Director of the new Center for the 21st Century Universities at Georgia Tech. Um, previously, he had academic positions at Purdue, University of Wisconsin, and the University of Padua. Um, he directed the Computer and Computation Research Division of the NSF and was Hewlett Packard's first CTO. Um, the author of over 100 articles and books, he's here to talk today about his new book, um, Abelard to Apple. And um, thanks so much for coming, Rich. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for, for coming. Um, I want to talk to you about, about um, um, what I'm thinking of as the fate, future fate of, of American uh, higher education. Um, I'm sort of an unlikely person to write a book about university. If, if, you, if you think about, about the, the famous books about, about higher education, uh, they're usually written by college presidents. The college presidents leave and write a memoir of their, of their experience. Sometimes they're written by uh, people who do research in education, so they present original, original research results. Um, policy people, economists who have kind of deep things to say about, um, uh, about education. And of course, I'm, I'm none of those. And, and to be honest, I didn't set out to write this book. Um, when I stepped down as, as dean in, um, in 2009, I, uh, I really had a very different book in, in mind. I was, I was going to write a book uh, about, uh, about innovation, because there just aren't enough books out there about innovation. Uh, and, and fortunately, I was saved from that, from that, that fate. Uh, when I did step down, I, I decided to write, as a lot of deans do, a valedictory. So I wanted to kind of summarize in four or five pages things I had learned as a, as a dean to, to, uh, to hand off to, um, uh, to my boss and, and my, uh, my fellow, fellow deans at, at Georgia Tech. So I wrote this four or five page little thing and circulated it and I started to get questions from people. I didn't know that or I don't believe that. So grumble, grumble, I'd go back and, and, and expand on something I had said uh, and pretty soon my little five page memo was a 10 page memo, then a 15 page memo, then a 100 page uh, memo and at some point I decided to stop because I just was tired about writing um, about being uh, a dean. And Happened to make a trip to see my editor at, uh, at MIT Press um, for, my, um, for my innovation book. Uh, and she happened to ask over lunch, so what else are you working on? Uh, and I said, well, really nothing, except I've got this 100-page thing that I don't know what to, to do with. And she said, oh, what's it about? And I said, well, it's about why college costs so much, why um, the outcomes are so bad, why universities are slow, um, are slow to change. And she said, oh, well, that's really interesting because that's the number one thing that we hear about these days uh, as, as, a, um, uh, as an opportunity for, for, for books. Uh, so I quite wisely dropped my book on, on, on innovation uh, and spent the next year uh, putting together uh, this book on, on f the future of universities. And I was a little ways into the project. Um, I, I, I sort of anticipated this book to be a book written by a professor for other professors. And I was a little ways into the project and um, was at a social gathering and someone said, oh, what are you working on? And I told this story. Uh, and, and they said, well, give me an example. So I gave some examples. Eyes glazed over. Uh, not because they were, they were probably bored with the conversation, but they, 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 uh, uh, they had no idea what I was talking about. And these were people that were on my advisory board that had advanced degrees uh, from Georgia Tech and Carnegie Mellon and, 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 and MIT. They just had no idea what this conversation was all about. So a couple months into writing the book, I made a right turn. And, and, and the right turn was to, to stop writing a book for people in academia and start writing a book for my friends. Uh, so so the, the, the book I'm going to talk to you about today is really uh, a book that was intended to be a conversation starter for everyone else in the world who's not deeply involved uh, in the minutia uh, and, um, uh, and, and processes of, of higher education. 
Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk along the ways about uh, some of the things that, um, that people are, um, are concerned about. I guess the first thing to do is explain the title of the book, Abelard to, um, to Apple. Um, first of all, why Apple? Well, I searched really hard for a medieval scholar that began with G or Y. Um, and sorry, there aren't any. There are, there are barely any with M, um, but, uh, but there are a lot with A. Anselm, Aquinas, and Peter Abelard, who it turns out has an interesting story independent of the history of Western universities. So Peter Abelard um, was an 11th century French monk. And he's mainly known for his um, unfortunate love affair with a woman named Heloise. It ended badly for both of them. That's how most people know uh, about Peter, um, Peter Abelard. Uh, you know, I'm a product of a, of a Catholic liberal arts education, so I knew about Peter Abelard um, from, from early days. But I, I had a chance to get reacquainted with him when HP bought Compaq because um, they had code names. Uh, HP was called Heloise, and Compaq was called Abelard. It was unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> and, and it was entirely Michael Capellas' own doing for not Googling Peter Abelard. Uh, to realize that Carly Fiorina, who of course was a classic scholar, knew the history completely uh, and, and, uh, and knew that that as a result of this love affair, Peter Abelard was castrated. So um, I, I, I did a little digging around, around that time. It sort of stuck in the back of my mind as I was looking for a title for this, um, for the, for this book. So, so that's the Abelard of Abelard to, to, to Apple. Apple is the Apple of Abelard to Apple, sort of inspired by, by iTunes, um, iTunes U. And, and really, the book um, is is about this historical arc. I'm not only not an economist, I'm not a, I'm not a historian, um, but, but I do talk about the historical arc from, from this 11th century monk, who's arguably the first true, pure university professor, to what's happening in education today. At the time that I wrote the book, that was kind of epitomized by, by, by iTunes, um, iTunes U. Peter Abelard was a physically imposing, compelling, handsome, guy who would draw thousands of people to hear his, um, um, his lectures. He was an iconoclast. He thought nothing of tweaking the nose of, um, uh, of the ecclesiastical establishment. Uh, his masterwork is something called Yes and No, Sic et Non in, 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 in Latin. Uh, and, and it's really a way of using the inherent contradictions of the church hierarchy of the day to, to form these, these uh, um, uh, these arguments, uh, and, and students would learn how to argue on, on, on that, that base. So it was all about mentoring. It was all about the, the physical presence of Peter Abelard and, um, uh, and what he had to offer to, to, his, to his students. Um, and what's that got to do with, with, with iTunes U or, or, or YouTube, uh, YouTube EDU? Well, in many ways, what we're talking about is projecting modern day Peter Abelards out to not an audience of thousands of people who come from from uh, medieval towns in, in, in Europe, but to a global audience who are looking for that kind of, uh, that kind of engagement. Um, the subtitle of the book is um, The Fate of American Colleges and Universities. So why not the future um, of American Colleges and Universities? Uh, as one of the reviewers of the book said, fate is a much more interesting word uh, than, um, than, than future. Sort of uh, draws you into a discussion of what the fate Yes, well. Uh, so the fate of, of, of universities, it turns out, um, is, um, is to be subject to the same economic, political, geographic forces as every other human institution. Uh, and, and, and from that premise, a lot of things follow, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of them today. Believe it or not, believe it or not, you can get into a very good argument in faculty lounges about whether or not that proposition uh, is, um, is true. Maybe we'll have that, dis th th that discussion uh, today. But, but my, 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 um, my view on this is, is, is not that I'm making a prediction about where universities are going to go. I'm not making a prediction about higher education. I'm simply making the observation that higher, higher education, whether it's here 
or in China or in, um, in Europe is a human endeavor. And it's going to be following paths that we have seen historically uh, and um, uh, we kind of know how things are going to turn out in some of those, some of those cases. Um, well, let me, let me kind of get into it. Um, there are some controversial things in this, in this book, and, and, and let me just begin by facing those, um, those head on. Not nearly as controversial as I thought um, some of my arguments were, were going to be. Um, I, um, I was with, with a, a colleague, so I'm very hard about um, uh, criticizing, for example, accrediting agencies and the idea of accreditation in, in higher education. And I, I thought I was really going to be edgy about this, and I was with a colleague uh, last week uh, who said, well, why did you pull your punches uh, about accreditation? So, so take this idea of controversy with, with, with a, a grain of salt. But, but some of the things that, that people have, have mentioned and talked about uh, have to do with, um, with comparisons that, that, that I make. So for example, I talk a lot about, about faculty centrism and student centrism um, in universities. And, and I, I, I do this in a way that could very easily be misunderstood, which is great for selling books. Um, but the idea is that very early in the history of Western universities, um, there was a schism in the idea of a university. So the Italian universities, first, the first universities were what are called student-centered universities. Students would come from all over Europe, all over the world actually, to places like Bologna because there was a concentration of scholars that knew about law uh, in, in Bologna. Um, but the university played virtually no role in that at all. Students would show up, they would decide whether or not they wanted to pay to attend. Uh, they would decide whether or not uh, a, a professor was, was giving them value for what they, uh, what they, what they sought. Um, the state provided sanctions um, for, uh, for non-performance. The students sort of ran the show. Then the French got a hold of the idea of, of universities and the whole picture changed. French became what are called master universities. And the idea of a master university is, is that the faculty members are in charge. Uh, and of course what happens when, when a profession takes over an institution is the minutia of the profession tends to dominate the internal, internal discussion. So you'll, you'll find these letters uh, among French professors from the, um, uh, from the 13th century that, that, that talk, for example, about how fast they should write, on, uh, uh, you know, write, out their, write out their notes. Do you want students to actually be able to take notes contemporaneously? And there's a group that says yes and a group that says, um, that, that says no. Um, there's a lot of um, the sociology of the way a university works that owes directly to this kind of contradictory view of universities. Southern universities in Europe were basically run by and for students. Northern universities by and for faculty members. Um, when, when the US kind of imported the idea of a university, what universities did they look toward? Oxford, Cambridge, Johns Hopkins looked toward the German, uh, German research. Universities, so this, this this idea of a faculty-centric culture um, kind of is, is carried along in that um, in, in that in that wave. And Frederick Rudolph, who, who who has a wonderful history of of higher education in the in the U.S., makes the point that at the point in which the Johns Hopkins faculty, just after the Civil War, was deciding how they were going to work, um, they decided that it was the purpose of the students to stimulate the faculty rather than the other way, other way around. And that, that's kind of a metaphor for, for, for how universities uh, develop, particularly research, uh, research universities. Um, I'm, I'm critical of presidents in this, uh, in this book. In fact, I have a whole chapter called The Smartest Kid in Class. Uh, and I think the title kind of says, uh, says it all. Uh, presidents are the people who are most able to change directions when they see universities heading off. Uh, in unproductive ways, and some of them have uh, in, the, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the past. Um, you know, when, when 
when, um, when Harvard abolished its required, required curriculum, um, it was because Charles Eliot, much to the surprise of the people that hired him as president, said, we're not going to have required courses uh, any, anymore. And it sort of brought the, 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 the required classical Latin-based curriculum of American higher education um, down. And, and I, I really do um, lament the, the um, I think, decreasingly small fraction of American presidents that, that are willing to do bold things. There are relatively, relatively, relatively few, and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. I mentioned some of them in the, um, uh, in the, in the book as well. Um, I, guess, I guess the other thing that tends to draw incoming fire uh, is, is actually not something I say in the book, not something I intended, um, but it's, it's, it's a kind of made up um, clash between the sciences and the humanities. So I talk in the book a lot, for example, about the value of a university. I'm not the first person to talk about the value uh, of, a, of a university. Um, this discussion has been going on for, for a, a long time. But um, liberal arts professors have interpreted this as me requiring a dollar value to be placed on the output of a university, on a university degree. Uh, and, and I guess, I guess the, um, uh, the unwritten assumption there is that if you're in the arts, if you're in the humanities, it's much more difficult to quantify the value of, of your degree. That's an interesting discussion. It's not one that I, um, that I, I intended. Although given the, the dramatic increase in cost of a college education, it's sort of a timely discussion to have. Because when you're paying $2,000 uh, a year for a college education, and you decide that you want to major in, in art history, it becomes relatively less important about how you're going to pay off that college loan than when you're paying $50,000 uh, a year, which is the, the, the situation that we have, we have now. Um, it's only been a couple months since, since uh, student loan debt crossed over credit card debt as a major source of indebtedness for, for American, uh, American families. So, so a lot of the things that we believe uh, about the value of a college education has this context around it which says, well, the college education is relatively cheap. You know, it's a place where post-adolescents go and, 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 and grow and learn this stuff and then, and then they leave and, and, do, um, and do other things. And that world has certainly, um, has certainly changed. Yeah, I talked about, I talked about um, kind of backyard summer picnic conversations I, I had with, 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 with neighbors. There's, there's, um, there's a, a big discussion that's taking place kind of outside earshot of college professors about colleges. Uh, and, and a lot of it is informed by what you see in the media. A lot of it is informed by assumptions about the way, um, the way universities, universities work. Uh, if, if you spend any time, for example, watching cable news broadcasts, you'll see someone get up and say, we're producing too few college students, we're producing college students that flip burgers for a living. We, we, um, the cost of college is driven by the availability of student loans. A lot of, a lot of statements made uh, about the way higher education works. So I wanted in this book um, to not be a, a, a textbook about how universities work, but to be a story. And that's, that's how I got to this Abelard to Apple, um, Abelard to Apple title. I wanted it to be a story that con kind of conveys not only the sweep of, of, of what's happened over the last thousand years in, in, in higher education, but also drills down on some of these, uh, on some of these issues. So, so this issue, for example, how many, how many college students should we be producing? Are we producing college students that flip burgers uh, for a it, it is, is um, kind of conditioned on the fact that no one has ever checked to see. How many college graduates should we be uh, producing? A guy named Anthony Carnival at Georgetown um, University decided to do, to do a horizontal study, a macroeconomic study of, of, of the production of, of college graduates. And it turns out that the US has been underproducing college graduates uh, for the last 30 years to the tune of about a million students a year. 
So, we sit here today in 2012, and, and we are probably 20 million, uh, 20 million uh, short. Yes? So, so the, que the question is, what does it mean to say you're, you're underproducing? The, the, the demand for college graduates exceeds the supply by about a million students, uh, students a, a year. Um, now, you know, that's a number that you, can, that you can look at and say, yeah, but where are those students going, going to go? And, and they went further than that. So what they did is they, they looked at the Department of Labor uh, ranking of skill levels that are required for, for jobs. So just you know, kind of in, in, uh, in, in rough terms, there, there are jobs that have very low threshold for skill requirements, retail clerks, for, for example. Uh, there are highly skilled jobs, rocket scientists, Google engineers. Uh, and, and, and there are, in, in the middle, uh, jobs that, that may or may not be filled by people with, with, college, uh, with college degrees. So if you look at the lowest level, skill level, for, for example, indeed, you will find um, college graduates filling some of those. There are college graduates that flip burgers for a living, but not many. Not many. Uh, somewhere between 1 and 2 percent of those jobs are held by college graduates. And it turns out that if you're flipping burgers for a living, you're better off having a college degree than not. Uh, because over the lifetime of your burger flipping career, uh, you, will, you will end up financially better off than someone with only a high school, uh, with only a high school degree. So you can kind of look at, at, the, um, uh, at the coffee um, you know, coffee table discussions of what's going on in higher education say, well, there are things that are true that we can measure. There are things that are, are not true that we, we can only, um, only ponder. And then, the, and then there are trends and, and, and directions. And that's really what I want to I talk about. And I want to tell you a story. And I'll, I'll read a short passage from the, um, um, from the, from the book. But, but the story, in order to make sense of the story, um, you sort of have to understand that um, higher education in this country, in most countries of, of the world, is a class system. Kind of a jarring concept. You don't you think of universities as being meritocracies and egalitarian and all of this. All, they're a class system. And, and one of the manifestations of being a class system is that there are universities at the top. There are elite universities. Uh, and we all know who is in that, uh, is in that, that, that class. The Ivy Leagues, for example. Uh, are in that class. Georgia Tech may or may not be in that, uh, in, in that class. Um, but uh, Dade Community College is certainly not uh, in, that, in that class. That is the middle. There are somewhere between three and 4,000 universities in the middle. Universities that, that are not distinguished by the size of their endowment, by the uh, distinguished nature of their, of their alumni, by, by the uh, scholarly achievements of their, uh, of their faculty. They're in the middle. Uh, and, and life in the middle is not terrific right now. It's a financial struggle. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cultural struggle. It's a, it's a, political, uh, it's a political struggle. So let me, let me um, kind of turn to a passage in the book from a chapter um, entitled Beware the Well-Oiled Machine uh, because I, I, I think it, it, uh, it will tell you a little bit about the middle. Linda's first challenge when she was named department head was to reform the curriculum. Students were required to take the introductory courses in her department. This requirement meant that the instructional workload for the introductory teachers amounted to thousands of credit hours per year, many more contact hours than would be consistent with effective mentoring. Over time, the department had to figure out how to cope with such a high workload. They decided to become a sort of factory. Part-time instructors, usually retired professionals, were handed an hour-by-hour -hour lesson plan and a large stack of overhead transparencies for recitation to 100 freshmen. Projects were carried out in smaller groups under the supervision of teaching assistants, many of them undergraduates themselves. Tenure-track faculty members had virtually no contact with freshmen, and there was no faculty supervision of the introductory course sequence. A student services organization staffed entirely by non-faculty academic professionals and advisors oversaw the entire operation, which consumed a sizable fraction 
of the department's operating budget. By 2002, the results were indisputable. A cheating scandal was exposed to the glare of national media, lab assignments and projects designed as a rite of passage by upperclassmen and graduate students required an unreasonable amount of time to complete and were wildly out of sync with the academic goals of most students. Business, science and engineering students, for example, were barred from using tools that the instructors did not like, even though familiarity with those tools would be required in later courses on campus. Student complaints far exceeded any other unit on campus and the attrition rate for students in Linda's department was well above 50%. Even worse, the introductory courses alienated female students. Male teaching assistants assigned project tasks by gender. Women were assigned writing and documentation tasks. Men were assigned leadership roles. Female enrollment was a full 10 points lower than the national average and 20 points below the levels of other departments in the university. Open-ended comments from uh, students confirmed that there were few mature guiding hands in the introductory courses. So Linda's first step was to hire Mark, the respected a senior professor who had a reputation as a sort of turnaround expert to guide the reorganization of student services. Mark began to review operations of the student services organization, but longtime staffers immediately warned him that he should not mess around with how things were currently being done because it's a well-oiled machine. It was a revelation. Even the support staff thought of themselves as workers on the factory floor. And the learning spaces reflected it. Students hung out on long wooden benches in a large lobby area with a shabby green carpet. To get to in, uh, instructor's offices, students had to pass under a hand-lettered sign that said swamp. This was a remarkably effective setup for the students who chose to remain. But students on campus and off campus were choosing other paths in increasingly large numbers. Students liked but did not respect their instructors and their ratings were alarmingly low. Despite a public scandal, an alarming retention rate among the best students, an increasingly hostile, hostile environment for females, and poor ratings from students and faculty members in other departments, student services staff members received consistently high marks from their supervisors during annual performance reviews. It did not take Mark long to figure out why the supervisors loved the well-oiled machine. The cost of instruction for the introductory courses was low, and advisors effectively moved the few students who chose to remain through the program without a lot of hassle. Accreditation teams routinely approved the curriculum without requiring much from the department. And best of all, tenured faculty members were rarely bothered by undergraduates. While students, alumni, and an alarmed public were letting Mark know that the well machine was not doing its job, the department's research reputation continued to rise in national rankings. In the strange accounting of the middle, things were going well. So this is a story that's repeated many thousands of times around, around the country. Uh, and, and it is a metaphor for a lot of the discussions about where higher education is going to take us. So where's it going? Um, I want to talk about disruption. There are a lot of books about disruption out there. It seems like every week there's a new book about disruption uh, in, uh, in higher education. Uh, and, and I don't mean to add to that list of, um, uh, of books. Uh, a lot of books look at the situation and say more funding, that's going to help. Uh, or more technology or stop coddling, um, coddling professors. Um, there are certainly a lot of books that look at the, at the uh, at the alarming increase in tuition costs and, and have suggestions about how to fix that. Get rid of tenure, stop paying professors, use, use, use part-time um, part faculty members. Um, very few people have looked, for example, about what's driving the increase in costs in higher education. The number one cost driver in higher education uh, is making up for lost revenue. So you saw in the 2008 crash, endowments go down. You saw states slashing university budgets. Universities continued to spend as if that money were there. And the only source of funds to do that is student tuition. So that was the driver for, initial driver for uh, 
uh, for tuition increases. The easy answers, the things that people talk to you about, if we just had more productive professors, if we paid professors less, don't even make the top 15. Don't even make the top 15. Intercollegiate athletics is a bigger contributor to tuition increases than faculty, faculty salaries. This is an interesting side, sidebar. I don't mean to get into intercollegiate a, 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 athletics because I, I love Georgia Tech football. But the fact of the matter is that if you look at the, was 119 uh, uh, BCS schools, 119 bowl eligible football, uh, football schools, half of them lose money. Half of them lose money. I'm sorry, two thirds of them lose money. Half of them lose $10 million or more a year. Where does that money come from? It comes from academics. The only fungible source of revenue in the university is the stuff that goes into the, in, into the classroom. So when you look at the layers of, of, of kind of cause effect for, uh, for why tuitions are, are, are going through the, through the roof, there are, are, are 14 or 15 drivers like that that, that, um, uh, that contribute. Yes, Peter. Yeah, so, so presidents, presidents will say, presidents have been known to say, my president has been known to say um, that, this is being recorded, um, um, that, um, that athletics is a front porch to the university. That donations to athletics don't compete with academics because those people would never contribute to uh, athletics anyway. It's a hypothesis that's never been tested. And every dean in the country will be able to tell you stories about a potential academic donor that was swiped by athletics. Why put your nail on this chemistry lab where you don't understand what's going on when you can have this beautiful skybox in our uh, in our, our, our football stadium. So there's an extraction of, of, of value, an extraction of wealth from, from one part of the university, a non-core activity, by the way, to, um, uh, from, from a core activity, academics, to a non-core non um, uh, activity. Um, research, so let's, let's, let's just spend a couple seconds talking about, talking about, about re research. Um, there's, there's, a firm belief in universities that research adds to the bottom line of the university, sponsored, sponsored research. If we just had a bigger research program, we could fix our, um, uh, our finances. I was um, driving across, um, what's that little part of Texas that sticks up? Is that the panhandle? Driving across the Texas, Texas panhandle, and I saw a sign for a local university that said, University XYZ, the next great research university. Uh, and I had to stop the car um, and call my wife. Uh, in the first place, this is, this is a university that has no chance at all of being the next great research university, and they already have some great undergraduate programs. I know what it's going to cost them to pursue that goal. It costs a university two and a half dollars to bring in every dollar of sponsored research. It's a number that People have a hard time getting their arms around, but it's true. Uh, if you just take a look at the productivity decrease, the long sales cycle, the, long, the, the large cost of sales, the low uh, success rate on, on, on contracts, and did um, you know, a P&L for the university, you would find that, that that dollar of revenue cost you two and a half dollars to bring it. That's why industrial research labs cost the government two to three times what a university research lab will cost because they can't take money from academic programs to cover the cost of, um, uh, of, of research. Um, so there are lots of books about, um, about dis disruption. Uh, out there. What, do you, what do you do about this? A lot, of, a lot of books say change who you are. A lot of books say, um, uh, it's Clayton Christensen's um, new book, which, which I happen to love, uh, says change the DNA of the university. It never works that way. It's hard to change who you, who you are. And, and when, I, when I, I have this kind of discussion with um, you know, presidents who are doing um, 
you know, off-site planning sessions for their senior leadership, leadership teams, the first thing I say is you can't change who you are. Uh, you can discover who you are. You can, you can figure out what your, what your value is. It's a very difficult thing, thing to, to, to do. There's an easy exercise for college presidents. Um, and, and you can sometimes get away with it. Uh, I, I, will, I, will, I will print hard copies of strategic plans from two universities, the one that I'm visiting and just another, uh, another university and, and X out the names of the, uh, um, the identifying names in the, in, in the document and show them to the leadership team and say, which, so which is which? You, t you tell me. And as you might expect, you can just freely substitute the names of universities between strategic plans and it doesn't make any, any difference. How can you make a cogent argument about your value if you have a completely generic view about what you're, what you're doing? We're going to empower students, we're going to promote success, we're going to have a diverse, uh, a diverse camp. You know, all the things that you find in strategic plans for universities, they are the same from university to university, with the exception of places that have thought through who they are. In those universities, just shine like stars. Uh, they're not necessarily going to be successful, but they shine like, 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 like stars. So if, if you look at Harvey Mudd's strategic plan, for, for example, you know, it, it talks about the liberal arts education of an engineer or scientist. It talks about producing people that can go into, uh, uh, into policy positions, that can go into, uh, into law school. It talks about uh, teaching liberal arts subjects in an integral fashion with technical subjects talks about teaching writing as a part of a math course. That's a new idea. If you look at the strategic plan for Arizona State University, sort of a university that's in the middle, near the top of the middle, but it's, it's, in, it's in the middle, what does it say? It says, our goal is to provide access to all qualified students in the state of Arizona. And what do they mean by qualified students? They don't mean that they're doing an increasingly strict selection of freshmen. It means that they looked at what the admission requirements were at Berkeley in 1960. B average, good test scores, good recommendations from high school students. That's the bar at Arizona State. Now, it's a big number. It's a frighteningly large number. And, and they have to figure out how to, how to, how to deal with, with that. But it's an example of a university that's rooted. It's a public university. It's rooted in a place they understand the place that they, that, that they exist in, and, and their mission is dedicated to providing value to, those, um, to the, those students. So you can see university after university that's thought through this, that's not the 2,000, that's not the 3,000. Those are the shining stars. Those are the, those are the universities that, that, that have an idea of what students will get when they get their, their, their degree. Georgia Tech is one of those um, universities. So there's a... Um, uh, there, there's a lot of data known, for example, about return on investment for, uh, uh, for tuition. Um, you can look at what you paid for tuition versus what you will earn over the next, the next 30 years, and, and, and people have collected this, um, this, this data. There's a handful of universities at the top. It used to be, it used to be that, that, that those numbers overwhelmingly favored a university education. If you got a university degree, you were guaranteed to get a, a, a good return on your tuition investment. That number has gone, uh, has gone down. But there are some universities at the top. Caltech is at the top. MIT's at the top. Berkeley's at the, uh, at, at the top. The number one expressed as a, as a percentage return on investment over 30 years, um, number one university in the country is Georgia Tech. 14% return on investment. Even with the raised tuition, that's not a bad um, that, that's not a bad uh, return on it. So what is Georgia Tech's value prop? Georgia Tech's value proposition is that you come out of Georgia Tech as a bench engineer. Certainly we produce lots of what we produce, people that get, uh, get Rhodes scholarships and, and, and go on to graduate school and become great scientists, but our, our strong suit is that we produce tough, competitive, knowledgeable, flexible engineers, and that's why they do well over their, um, over their, their career. Um, so, so this this idea of knowing your value is extremely um, is extremely um, uh, important. Um, so, you know, th th there are these books that, that will lay out the problems for you. Um, I, I think everyone kind of recognizes what what the problems are. I want to concentrate in little time I have 
um, I have left by kind of talking about what's going on and, and what, can be, um, what can be done about it. Uh, you should have, I think, um, been able to figure out by now that in a lot of ways, um, higher education, particularly in the United States, is an economic bubble. Tuition is growing four times cost of living. There's a sense of entitlement uh, on the part of, uh, um, of institutions. There's a lack of genuine oversight uh, by agencies that are supposed to make sure that what's going on is what's supposed to, uh, what's it has all the characteristics of an economic, uh, an economic bubble. And higher education is 4% of GDP, so a collapsing bubble in higher education is a pretty big deal for the US, um, for the US economy. Um, what can you do about that? I would like to think, and this gets back to what I was saying a few minutes ago about presidents, I would like to think that the things that made American higher education great can be reignited. So what are those things? Um, if, I had to, if I had to talk to you about just one thing, it would be the idea of experimentation. Where are the experiments in higher education? Where is the new Williams College? If you go back a thousand years and, and trace this history, trace this history through, in, in the Middle Ages, there were uh, dozens of universities. You could keep them all in your head. You know, there was Bologna and Padua and, and, and Barcelona and Paris. Um, later on, there was Oxford. And, and, and there, there were just dozens of them, not a large, not a large number. And, and they went through the same kinds of processes that we're talking about now. They became inwardly focused, they became uh, entitled, they became ossified. Uh, a lot of people called them um, uh, uh, homes of out, outmoded knowledge, kind of reading the critics of the, of, the, of, of the day, until the Jesuits came along. Jesuits in the south, the academies in the, in, in the north. and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we have a new way of educating students. Um, you guys have written all the textbooks, we know what it means to teach a student. And so they attracted a whole new kind of student who was willing to pay a different amount of money for, for, uh, um, for education. Uh, and, and it upset the apple cart. By the time the colonial universities uh, got going in, in the US, uh, there were hundreds of universities. Hundreds here. England only had two, three. We had hundreds. Uh, after the Civil War, there were thousands. I talk in the book about 1852. 1852 uh, is, is, in my way of thinking, a banner year for American higher education uh, because the number of, of brilliantly conceived universities that were founded in 1852 is phenomenal. Tufts was founded. Mills was founded. Um, Sort of unclear when when Amherst and and, and, and Williams were, were founded, but it was in that same that that, that same period of of of, of time. Um, at the turn of the century, between the U.S. and Asia, uh, tens of thousands of, of universities. So a lot of these places don't exist today. They were experiments, and it, when you have experiments, sometimes you have success, sometimes you have um, you have you have failures. But we have had in this country no experiments since 1960. There has been literally no increase in capacity since 1960. There's been one new research university since the turn of the century, since 2000. UC Merced, and UC Merced is kind of on life support at, at the moment because of, of the, the, the California economic um, situation. Meanwhile, what's happening? India has announced plans to open 37,000 new universities. Why 37,000? Well, they did the arithmetic. Uh, India currently sends 11 to 12 percent of its high school students to college. They know that to be internationally competitive, the number has to be closer to 50 percent. Do the math, that's about 300 million students. Divide that up among 10,000 student universities, and, and it's, it's about 30,000 um, universities. Now, you can't open that many universities in 10 years. There's not enough bricks in India to do that, probably. So, so they must have something else in mind. And they do, but they don't know exactly what. 
So there's going to be a lot of experimentation and there's going to be a lot of innovation uh, in India that will change what it means to be a university for a large population that is just gathering steam in Western economies. And the same thing holds true with, with China. At the same time, the US is withdrawing and not carrying out this kind of, uh, this kind of experimentation, except for, dare we say it, the for-profit institutions, which everyone thinks of as the low cost supplier of continuing education for the, for the country. There's a hotbed of innovation that's taking place, taking place there. You would hope that that would ignite a hotbed of innovation in American universities. And the fact is it hasn't. There are a few. I mean, Stanford is doing a massively open online course in, in, in AI. MIT has announced MIT, uh, MIT uh, uh, X and, and you know, was the first out of the gate with open, uh, open courseware. There, there are a lot of universities in, in that top category, in that elite category, that feel that they have the freedom to spread their wings and, um, and experiment. But for the most part, institutions in the middle are not experimenting. They're sort of stuck in, in, the, in, in the past. And at the, at, at the end of the book, um, I sort of talk about the consequences of, of this. And we don't have time for me to read the entire passage. So, so, so let me just tell you what, 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 um, what I'm talking about here. Uh, and then we can open this up to, to questions or um, or discussion. So one of these schools that was founded in 1852 uh, was Antioch College, founded by Horace Mann, the great progressive leader of American higher education of the 19th, of the 19th century. And for most of its history, Antioch College was a beacon of progressive thought. Coretta Scott King went there. It enrolled um, uh, the first, uh, first African-American um, um, uh, classes. Uh, first truly integrated American, uh, African American classes, um, they, they, became, they became a place where people thought they could go to um, become part of a movement. I, in fact, I, I was, um, this interesting history here, I, I was driving across the country in 1969. And, and happened to stop in, in Antioch. I didn't happen to stop in Antioch. I wanted to stop uh, in, in Antioch and just sort of kind of absorb the culture. It was kind of a cross between Berkeley and Madison. And it was, it was, it was a really cool place, uh, cool place to be. And I hadn't thought about Antioch much until I was finishing the book. Uh, and and um, as I was finishing the book, I saw this op-ed piece in the New York Times. It said Antioch was written as an obituary. Antioch, where the arts were too liberal. So Antioch College closed in 2009. Closed its, 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 its doors. Um, and there was, a, there was a, a big investigation about why, uh, why it was so. Um, the faculty lodged complaints with the, uh, with, with the, with the, with the AAU uh, talking about the lack of, of of, of processes for, for closing the university. Well, the fact of the matter is that the Antioch faculty had pushed through a strategic plan two years before. And the strategic plan was aimed at narrowing the scope of students that would be acceptable to Antioch faculty. Now, hence the title and the obituary where the arts were too, were too liberal. You sort of had to pass a litmus test. And, and the predictable thing happened. Their endowments went away. Their applications went away. When they closed their doors, their freshman class had 50 students. They had 200 students enrolled. Their endowment had shrunk to $5 million. Uh, to $5 million. Uh, and they still have plans to reopen, probably still do have plans to reopen in the same uh, in, in the same. And no one during this whole process thought to ask what the role of that strategic plan was in the failure of Antioch. And the subtext to this story is that Antioch is a wholly owned subsidiary of Antioch University, an online university whose enrollments just continue to grow. So Horace Mann's university winked out of existence while the online university, uh, online university grew. And the, 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 the book ends with a little story that, um, that I want to I wanna read to you. So 
so I, I, I've completed the book. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to colleagues about it. Um, and, and in an epilogue, I say this. The Antioch College story came up at dinner one evening. I was visiting the chair of a well-respected department at a large land-grant college in the middle, um, in the, in the middle uh, near the top of the middle, but struggling, like most public universities, with budget cuts that threatened to reverse gains in research stature made during the last 10 years. At the end of the story, my host said, that's not our problem, we're at capacity. There is no way we can absorb more students. I asked if there were more students that could be admitted, and he said, sure, but they'll find somewhere else to go. Where, I asked. He thought for a minute. and came up with a list of alternatives. Some were above his institution in the reputational pyramid, some were competitors, and some were in China and India. Then he said, a lot will get online degrees. So you're getting a smaller share of a growing number of students, I said. And he was quick with his reply. Those are students we don't want. You don't understand, Rich. We have no more capacity. We went on like this for a little while. And finally, I asked why they were not figuring out how to give those students access. What happens in a growing marketplace when you're losing market share to your competitors who are building capacity? He stopped. I pressed him. Where will those students go in 100 years? What will the universities that have the capacity for those students that you turn away look like? He realized I was asking him what the university of the 21st century would look like. After a long pause, he said, it will not look like us. And that's the moral of the story. So thank you. Yes. So I realize this is a broad question, but um, what do you what do you view as as a as a sort of idea of, of should there be a range of different kinds of universities? Like, you know, as Votech and the University of Phoenixes and, and the Harvards do they all fulfill different niches, and do you want to see more niches, or do you want to see them all sort of converging to one sort of thing? Yeah, no, well, you, converging to one sort of thing is, is not, a, not a winning proposition. That one of the reasons that we're in this situation uh, is what I call institutional envy. So, so uh, if you're a public university in the middle, you look at the University of Michigan, and that's who you want to behave like. Uh, if you're a private university, you look at, at Williams or Harvard, depending on your size, that's who you want to you want to emulate. So there, there's a strong tendency for a lot of economic and, and, and social reasons to try to push up into this, uh, into this hierarchy to, to create kind of e a canonical public university, a canonical private university, and it's been deadly for American higher education. It gets to this issue of experimentation. You want lots of different, you want lots of different, uh, different options. Uh, the demographics of higher ed is, is favoring that. Um, the, the current predictions are by 2020, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the demographic for, uh, current, currently colleges and universities aim at the 18, what's called the 18 to 24 year old range. So colleges are kind of built to cater to these post-adolescents. By 2020, half of the students will be over, over the age of 24. So there'll be people returning to school, there'll be single parents, there'll be you know, Gulf War veterans that are returning. There'll be recent, uh, recent immigrants. There'll be uh, an aging population that's returning to school. There are going to be people that aren't going to be impressed by football teams and dormitories. Uh, and, so, and so where is the money going to be? The money is going to be in catering to where most of the students are. That's where most of the students are, are going, to be, going to be. So it, it really doesn't make any sense to say, um, just like the Jesuits you know, said 600 years ago, it, it doesn't make, make any sense to say, well, this is what it means to be a faculty member, this is what it means to be, to be a student, and here's the cost of doing that when you have this wide array of people that you, uh, that you are now, now looking at. So you know, I, I, think, I think the for-profits will, um, will be continuing on for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, I, I think the, the competitive pressure for online universities, open university um, uh, in, uh, in, in the UK, 
uh, you know, enrolls a couple hundred thousand students, that's not a bad number, and, and you get a pretty good degree out of, out of open, um, open University, and, and that, that portfolio will, will continue. The question for us is, you know, are we going to concentrate on this path that we've been on, trying to move up the reputational hierarchy, or are we going to say, you know, it really is a much broader spectrum out there than, than we previously imagined? I have two seniors, one graduating from high school, one graduating from college this year. They're both, uh, one's considering engineering schools, the other's at a liberal arts school. Um, I'm quite aware that getting the degree is only a small part of going to college. Right. It, um, for many parents, it's sending students off to a relatively safe place to, to grow up and be experimental uh, within bounds. Um, how will that work when the students are not maturing? in that 18 to 24 year range when they're older? And how will the universities have to? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great question, and I don't, I don't know the answer to, to that. I mean, you, you can see um, there are a few models that are, that are evolving. Uh, you know, the Florida system, for example, uh, has, has um, a large community college network that feeds the four-year um, four institutions, and they're hitting this problem right, right now. So, so, so they have recent recently arrived immigrants, they have high school students that want to go to Central Florida. Central Florida has a capacity problem. How do those students enter into the, uh, enter into the, the system? That's, that's where um, you know, technology is going to play, um, play a role. Um, you know, do you, you sort of change the entry point to universities or something called articulated curricula? So you, you, uh, uh, you take into account the fact that students enter into a college curriculum for a variety of reasons at a variety of points. And, and have similarly diverse off ramps. Uh, sometimes they leave with a degree. Sometimes they don't leave with a with, with a with a degree. But can you capture the value of each of those streams and say, well, that's that's really what higher education is going to evolve um, evolve into? Some of them uh, will get on ships and airplanes uh, and go to Bangalore uh, or go to uh, go to go to Seoul uh, and find really really terrific uh, universities that are well funded by uh, by public. Public funds. We just we don't know. Yes. Hi. So, how would you comment on the universities here that are opening branches in other countries that that have the money, and supposedly these universities have the know-how to, and they're trying to basically jump the the hurdle of the finance here by opening there. And I don't know how they will be doing in like 10, 20 years. It's, it's a mixed bag, and, 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 and the experience has been has been very, uh, very mixed. I mean, Carnegie Mellon, for for example, I'm looking at my friend Jeff. Um, Car Carnegie Mellon has been sort of out there and opening um, uh, international campuses. I don't think it's been a great experience. Uh, I think I think financially and uh, and, and intellectually, uh, it it just sort of has a forced feeling to it. There are universities that have the brand where they can, you know, Harvard can, can open an MBA program anywhere in the world and attract, and attract students. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, University of New South Wales uh, that decides to build a $200 million campus uh, in, in Singapore and three months later closes uh, because the students that were supposed to be there never, uh, never materialized. Uh, and and it, 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 um, it's probably the case um, that, that, that there will be a few global presences. Um, you know, the, 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 um, uh, I don't have any, any inside information, but, but the, the, the overwhelming sense that you get from Stanford's foray into the, the New York competition, for example, was you know, Stanford expressing an interest in becoming a more global presence um, than, it, um, than it is. You can always already see that with, um, with, with Cornell. Those are experiments. Who knows how they're going to, they're, they're going to, to turn out. Um, the more interesting thing, I think, is to take a look at who's populating um, the, um, the new uh, iTunes U app uh, from Apple. Who are the first universities that are, are there? Well, Stanford is there, uh, but it's Open University with a pretty complete set of, set, set of offerings. Uh, and a little small university that's offering uh, iOS software development uh, courses in pretty complete, pretty complete format. So those are the kinds of experiments that I think are going to be um, are, are going to be interesting. There, there, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of financial incentives for opening foreign campuses that dry up 
um, once you kind of look behind the curtains, uh, I think the experience has not been great. You alluded, it, excuse me, you alluded, it, alluded to it a little bit earlier about um, uh, the share of um, what people are going into. So the, the example you used was the, the value of an art degree when you're paying $50,000 a year. Right. And I was listening to the, um, the State of the Union last night, and Obama was talking about the irony of the fact that we have high unemployment, yet open jobs for people that are uh, not sufficiently technically um, prepared for it. In his, he was talking about people getting associate's degrees for, for technical fields like that. But what about the model? You talked about um, the dismissing the, uh, the core curriculum. The question of, um, how do I state this? Um, how do we further this, this model that not only the, the number of college graduates that we have, but the ones in the fields that are necessary? And how do we affect that model? To me, in my college career, it was always, what are your interests? You should follow that, which is, necessar is not necessarily the best model for this. It's not necessarily the, be the best model. It, it's, it, as I said when I started, it's a great question to ask when you're paying $2,000 a year. Uh, it's a completely academic question, if I can use that phrase, when you're paying $50,000 uh, a year. So it, it, it may be great to pursue uh, a curriculum in the, in the classics if your education is, is free. Or if you're not expecting that college degree to be tied to, uh, uh, to a, a career goal. I used to teach in Padua, and, and, and uh, I had this discussion with my Italian uh, with my Italian students over the years as I was preparing the book. Um, and and the, the model in, in, in Italy and, and through most of Europe uh, is, is that there is no direct tie between a university education and a career, uh, career goal. And all of the surveys, all the surveys make that, um, make that, that, point, uh, that point clear. There's also there's no tuition. Yeah, so, so, so it gets back to this. If, if, if you're not putting any, anything in and you're looking at it as a, as a growth experience that the state is providing for you, you can afford to spend this time uh, growing up. Uh, if, if it's a $250,000 investment for a family that's making $75,000 a year, it's a completely different, it's a completely different, uh, different issue. Um, also, I have to say, and, and I, I don't say it in the book, but it's, it's one of the things that causes, causes a sharp discussion with my friends in the, in the humanities, that, that, that the art histories and the literature uh, curricula are not doing a terrific job. Uh, as much as we'd like to think that university education is a great place to learn a liberal arts, uh, to earn a liberal, art, liberal arts, arts background, the fact of the matter is it doesn't happen. Um, there's, there's a study um, by a guy named Richard Aram. Uh, he looked at 2,300 students uh, across, um, um, across multiple years, across a wide range of institutions to determine whether or not the general ed requirements in a typical college uh, curriculum had any effect at all. And, and the sad fact is half of the time, you can't tell whether a student has been through the first two years of college or not. So you're measuring critical reading skills, writing skills, uh, uh, reading, um, uh, reading skills, all the things that you're supposed to get out of the first two years, which are largely liberal, liberal arts, are not being done, uh, being done, done well. So uh, that seems to be a, a field that's ripe, that's ripe for, for ferment. But you know, to, to get to the, where I think your question is, is going, um, you're much better off with a college degree, and you're much, much better off with a college degree that's in a marketable, that's in a marketable area. Yes. So you talked about the skyrocketing cost of a college education. I wonder, um, how do you think financial aid figures into that? Because students are sort of insulated from the actual cost of their education. Um, and I guess another connection is that these for-profit universities don't, as far as I know, they don't actually have to deal with that. You actually have to pay for the, the education. The, the, no, the, the ones that are accredited are, are, are in, the same, in the same model. So, so accreditation entitles you uh, entitle students to receive uh, Title IV funds, so, so federal, federally backed, backed loans. Um, people go into debt. I mean, as, as I said, the, the, the amount of debt that's being accrued for higher education uh, is, is frightening and, um, and growing. Sort of along the same lines, um, your observation about skyrocketing tuition over the past three or four years being caused by vanishing endowments and things like that was interesting, and vanishing budgets and things like that. What do you think universities should have done, you know, given that all this money disappeared? Yeah, um, 
So it's a great, it's a great, great, great question. So, so a lot of what you see in higher ed today is is, is the result of um, um, what Clark Kerr, who ran the University of California system a generation ago, called the appearance of the multiversity. So you get all of these different stakeholders together on, on, on campus, and there are professional schools and undergraduate institutions and gradu graduate schools, uh, and, and, and they all sort of share in the same pie. Uh, and, and as long as the pie is growing, that tends to work pretty, pretty well. Um, but we're in a period of contraction now, uh, and, and not everyone is paying his or her fair share of operating the, the university. So we'll take sponsored research as a, as a case in, in point. Um, the National Science Foundation, um, major source of funding for basic research in, in academic computer science, comes nowhere near covering the cost of the research. And I'm not talking about overhead. I'm talking about the absolute cost of the research. They, they know that, that to fund a three-year project with, with with these goals requires this many professors and this many students, and they will arbitrarily give you one professor and one, and one student to carry out the same, the same goal. Well, you're still responsible for that research, and universities take it on themselves to, to pull that money from somewhere. It gets pulled from academic, academic programs. So um, activity by activity, a non-core activity on, on, on campus does not necessarily pay its own, its own way. If you simply had the ability to reverse that negative part of the multiversity and say, well, you know, we, we agree that these are good activities to have on campus, but let's make sure that everyone pays his own way, it would clarify a lot of the economics. Yeah, Jeff. Hey, Rich. I want to uh, thank you again for coming to Google and giving such a thought-provoking talk on a very relevant, timely subject. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it.